Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. So I know it's 4 p.m., so I'll probably hold you up for some more time. I know it's probably your coffee time. Um, just for some more time, and I'll let you guys go. So as you can see, my talk is about security. My area of expertise has been in security and anomalous behavior. Um, the talk goes over, is it time for security you know, to start using um, artificial intelligence? So is it, is it time that we start bringing in you know, intelligence and analytics? Not just analysis, analytics into security. And um, that's what we'll talk about. One of the primary reasons um, this is an area that I feel that needs to be discussed about more and more is because security is an industry, or security is actually a group in every company that uh, is considered to be the sinkhole of money. And I'm sure quite a few, few people at this table will agree, you know, if, if you're high up and you know, high enough, to know how your money flows, you know how much money security takes. Um, and most of the times, it doesn't do any good, it just protects you, and when things go wrong, you can't blame the security team, you just have to give up. And that's where, you know, um, it's almost always considered um, a sinkhole. So anyway, so let, let me go ahead. So in general, I'll just be discussing about, you know, the differences between um, analysis, analytics, and where AI sits, um, complexities in cybersecurity. What are the problems that we're facing right now? Some, some interesting, um, colorful examples, um, and how, how you could introduce ML and advanced analytics. So basically, the difference between analysis, analytics, and AI. So security as a field has always adopted analysis. So there is no dearth of analysis, by the way, in the field of security. The tons of researchers with tons of data sitting on it for years. Now, that's where the problem is, the years. We, we, we get a lot of data, and we sit on it for like three years to analyze every specific behavior. And by the time we have actually figured out every specific behavior, the attack vector has changed. So there's no point in using what we've already designed now. And the biggest problem with that is the zero-day vectors. I think, um, so zero-day vectors are basically the kind of vectors that, that attackers use, which they have designed probably you know, a few days ago, or a limited number of people actually know about it. And it's, 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 not, it's not seen the world, and these are the kind of vectors that, uh, when I say vectors, I actually mean methods of attack, methods of breaking into your corporate environment. And that's what zero-day vectors are. So um, because of that, you, know, you, you always have trouble, and analysis is fine. We, we, t we tend to understand a lot. But how do we put that analysis into production? How do we start predicting that there is a certain kind of attack that's going to happen? So now that's where your, uh, your analytics comes in. So when we start moving from analysis to analytics, I mean, um, we start bringing in predictability. Now, AI is actually a certain form of, of course, you know, we are in an ML conference, so we'll all know what AI is. Uh, I, at least I hope so. Um, so AI is basically, you know, bringing in intelligence with your analytics. It's like saying, um, okay, you know, there is a certain kind of thing that's happening in the, in the um, security infrastructure. We need to change our strategy, and we need to change our strategy instantly. And that's where you bring in your intelligence in this specific case. So um, the AI here in the security space might be very different than how it is in another space. But um, here it's more to do with, you know, acting on your feet than um, you know, bringing in more intelligence. It's more about the speed at which you act rather than um, how much of intelligence you pour in for any kind of an execution. So why does so much of complexity exist in the field of cybersecurity? Some of the things are complex protocols. Now, um, I'm, I'm sure anyone um, who is, who's taken you know, a class of networks or a class of for TCP IP kind of understands how much of information actually goes into a protocol. Uh, we've, got, we've got seven layers, you know, till the application layer. Each layer has its own interesting things. Thank God for, you know, Apple Talk and all of them to have disappeared right now. We just live on TCP IP, so that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, you have a complex set of protocols to work with. Uh, you need to understand how each, each protocol actually packs data. You need to understand 
how it can be exploited. You need to understand how things are vulnerable in each of these protocols. So that's your first space. So that's where the complexity actually begins. And now, added to that, data is cheap, storage is cheap. Collection of this has become a big mess. Um, a lot of us you know, in the enterprise networks have started to use Splunk. Splunk is actually one of the platforms you, know, you use to analyze data. But most of it actually goes through rule systems in Splunk. And you know, rule systems almost always have a limited scope in how you utilize it. So there is massive amounts of data from all your systems as well. Uh, let's say you have a corporate um, you know, laptop or a corporate um, phone, your network devices, um, your routers, your gateways, um, all these devices are actually sending in information to many different um, you know, collection points where you're assimilating data. Now, how, if you've been a system admin, and um, I'm telling from a point where I have been a system admin for a university, uh, for a department in a university, not a university. So it becomes really difficult to bring in all this data, you know, process it, actually make sense out of it. Um, sorry, actually make sense out of it. And that's a big issue. So where we are right now is we're collecting a lot of information, but we're not at a point where we can actually process all this information and go ahead and you know, make some sense out of it. And the attack asymmetry. Now, let's say I were to be a hacker, okay? And I control tons of botnets. So I have compromised about 300,000 systems or about a million systems across the world. And I've compromised all of this, and I am literally one guy who can send the command to all of these machines and make sure, you know, like how it happened last week, um, an, an entire, you know, Dyn DNS network is actually brought down. So it's that easy. It's, it's, it's not like, you know, physical warfare where you have 100 people fighting another 100 people. No, it's, it's, it's literally one person sitting in the basement and, you know, can fire off an attack that brings down a lot of critical infrastructure. And the bigger problems with this, of course, you know, once we go on a tangent is um, how do we restore critical infrastructure? DNS, um, as, I, as I said earlier, you know, the protocol that was actually attacked last week um, is a critical infrastructure for all of us to use. And so that, that's one problem. The next one is the attack surface itself is very distributed. Your attacks could be coming in from Asia, from you know, different parts of Europe, from South America, from different, different parts of the world. Um, there, have been some amount of, uh, there have been some amount of work that has been done to prevent you know, the distributed kind of attack. So there's something called a CDNs, uh, which people use. Basically, it's a like content delivery network, which are very specific to ASS. ASS are autom autonomous systems, you know, which limit traffic in a certain zone, and CDNs actually localize the traffic. So if you're in a certain AS network, and let's say you're looking for CNN.com, the, the request actually goes to the local you know, um, CDN, which is in your AS, not to an AS that's outside. So this is one of the ways in which people have prevented, I mean, um, systems actually prevent a distributed, um, distributed attack. But due to protocol requirements, there are ways that you can circumvent this. There are ways you can still focus the attack on specific um, machines and you can actually bring that down. So these are some of the very, um, you know, very elementary um, complexities that actually come up in the field of cybersecurity. Of course, there are a lot more. These are the ones that I, I would say actually precipitate, you know, when you look at uh, the, the field as a whole. So what happens when we get attacked? One of the first things, I think, um, so I, I spoke to a lot of people, you know, who have come to this conference. Most of them are from banks, um, you know, from telecommunication networks, from insurance agencies, and things like that. And we all have seen that one of the things that we hold, you know, dearer than life is PII of, of all our users. And um, the kind of trouble that we can get into if, you know, any of this personally identifiable information is lost is... You don't even want to imagine that. I mean, it, it's, it's that bad. Um, so, so that's our biggest problem, you know. As any of these agencies start to hold personal information, you don't want to be in a zone where, or, or in a space where you are, you're in trouble, you know, because you've lost this information. Um, so, you know, banks, corporations, governments, they routinely hold PII, and systems tend to get old, 
Um, you know, you don't update your security model, you don't update how you store your data, you don't tokenize your data. You have a big potential of getting hit, and, and that's, a, that's a big issue as well. So, so, so PII, as I say, you know, is, is one of the big issues that we all face. Um, some of the examples of the attacks that we've seen. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys must have known about the, uh, the OPM attack, which is you know, the, um, the federal government organization which manages all personal information for all um, federal employees. Uh, now, the interesting thing is you would say, oh, you know, oh what's lost out there? Well, nothing much. Probably, you know, someone who's working in NIST, you know, some scientist who's working in NIST, his personal information may be social security number. Or, you know, someone who's probably working in another federal organization, which is, you know, not that big a deal. But what OPM actually holds is it holds information of all the agents, you know, who are undercover across the world. Um, it, it, Every, every you know, government organization that is actually actively having people you know, around the world um, on duty, it holds all their information, and that's where things get into trouble. Now, if people who have access to this information figure out, who, well, figure out the real identity of all the agents around the world, then now you know you've put them in trouble. This is a whole different area of trouble that you put people into. It's not like I lost my credit card and someone went and swiped it and bought a $4,000 television, no. It's, I can't get out of this country because, you know, I've been cornered, because I've been identified. And it, so the situation actually scales up really badly, in a way. And, and that is why, you know, security tends to be very important. So the Sony hack. Well, the Sony hack, you know, when it started off, people thought it was very simple. It was a very, you know, basic hack. But no, um, you lost tons of information. You know, people lost the um, pe people lost a lot of their personal information, and um, there there is actually information that the Sony hack actually has not stopped. Sony tends to get hit again and again and again, even now, but on a smaller scale. But uh, when, when it was big, it actually lost millions of dollars in a lot of accounts. The Home Depot. Um, I'm not sure how many of you guys know about the Home Depot uh, the attack. The, it was close to about anywhere between 56 million credit cards and about 77, 000, 77 million credit cards. They're not sure what the number is, but they're just being safe. Um, so Home Depot actually got attacked on their point of sale systems. So the, 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 the way they, uh, the um, vector that they used was the same vector that was used in Target. They deployed um, a malicious piece of software on the point of sale system and the point of sale system ended up collecting tons of information about every credit card swipe. And it had access to you know, a lot of personal information. And um, there is also speculation, which has not yet been confirmed, is that there were, there were probably about um, 100 terabytes of personal identifiable information that was moved out of Home Depot's networks, which, is, uh, which I, I don't think it's confirmed yet. So, so these are some of the examples of how, you know, uh, corporations lose personal uh, information. And this is a big deal for all of us, um, primarily because now I think we've started to recognize that it's not that I am safe, it's, it, it's just a matter of time before you get hacked. And what you would have to start doing is you would have to start positioning yourself in a way that you're just one step or a couple of steps ahead of how the attacker moves. You, you cannot say, I, I am perfectly fine, you know, I'm safe. The only way you could say this is probably you shut off all your machines and, you know, don't do any transactions online. But that's not going to happen because most of the business happens on the internet. So you can only be, you know, a few steps ahead of the attacker and which has to be constantly evolving. So it's, it's almost always a case of cat and mouse. So, so, so that's one thing. Um, so where do we go from, so with, with all these examples, you know, why does analytics actually make sense for the field of security? So analytics has actually come a long way. We have, you know, algorithms like random forest, GBMs, and um, deep learning and neural networks. Of course, deep learning is, is one of the implement. Neural networks can also be considered as uh, one of the ways in which we look at deep learning as well. But these are some of the algorithms that are not tie problems anymore. Most of these things are used in a way, you know, where real-world solutions are actually being solved. I mean, real-world problems are actually being solved. 
Um, I think Sri probably briefly spoke earlier today where um, he would hope that there would be a time when we can start solving um, problems like cancer using machine learning. And that's actually you know, very inspiring when you look at it. So analytics has actually come a long way. And this is something that we can leverage it. And the reason why I say this is something that we can leverage and not something that we are already leveraging it is because, frankly, people in the field of security are very paranoid. And there is a very good reason for being paranoid. What you want to prevent is you want to prevent every attack. There is no probabilistic model in the field of security. You cannot be probabilistic. You have to, you have to stop every attack in the field of security because if you miss that one attack, you've lost all your data. You've lost everything that you try to protect. And, and with this paranoia, people have not ventured into things other than you know, rule-based systems. And rule-based systems have worked really well. But because of the size of data and how much we have in our rule-based system, um, we, we kind of, you know, in a, in a zone where we can't do much. So, which is why, you know, analytics actually is a good jump for us. So, advanced analytics. Why, why do we need advanced analytics for the field of security? Um, multiple sources of data. As I said, you know, even, even your uh, cell phone actually beeps back to the mothership or, you know, your corporate network. So, you need all this information to build something called as a context. And, and that is something that we are actually doing at H2O, is we are actually building the, um, the idea, we are actually building something called as a context, where you can bring in um, you know, different information, different sources of your log information. And you can, um, you, you, you can merge all this information in such a way, and you can study the behavior that's happening at a certain given point in time. And that actually helps you identify attacks and any kind of anomalous behavior um, that that's actually happening. So um, I kind of realize I'm over time. So I'll kind I'll skiply I'll very quickly just skip through this. So one of, um, and what what you also need for the field of security is you need things to be really fast and um, low latency actually helps. So if you have a process of predictability, if you have a process where you know your intelligence is really fast, and this ties back to the fact that where I said you just need to be a step or a couple of steps ahead of you know, the attacker, that's all. You do not have to be far ahead, you do not have to have an end-all solution, just a couple of steps actually helps, and the low latency actually helps in that case. So, but, but why AI, you know, why the intelligence part of it? Um, frankly, if you were to sit and analyze all this information, if you, were to, if you were to try and break this down, it would take you years to actually break down all these attacks. I mean, you, you can look at the Stuxnet, the Stuxnet, research on Stuxnet is still coming up. Um, so it actually takes a lot of time. Uh, so multiple vectors of attacks, many zero-day systems are there. And because of the research, the wait time is huge. So which is one of the reasons we actually need intelligence in the system. Um, having many people you know, research this problem will still not work. You literally need intelligence implemented in the system. And that, that's where it actually makes a difference. Um, so as I said earlier, you know, what, what we're doing, we're actually building um, on an idea that's called the, con that's called the context, where we're trying to bring in information from different areas, from different sources, um, to be able to correlate events, to be able to identify events that actually make sense and you know, disregard events that don't make sense. Um, this actually helps in the space for security where you, know, you can identify and say, hey, this is an actual attack while this is not. Um, this is actually threatening while this is not, or uh, this is something that we would want to investigate while, you know, this is something that's routine. Um, so that actually helps because of the size of data. And, um, you know, using that as a platform, you guys could make, you know, further changes in, how you, in, in your security posture. And having said that, um, I'd like to thank you guys for giving me the time to talk. Um, any questions? If there's any questions at all, please. If not, um, we can do it even while the coffee breaks on. Thank you.